purely by accident, the researchers and the ship crew are confronted by a vivid example of the devastating effect of the oil on wildlife. The nighttime discovery of a lone, oil-soaked bird 50 miles from shore really brings this home. Fortunately, a crew member was able to grab hold of the bird and get it on board. They begin working diligently and quickly to cleanse the oil-soaked feathers. Emotions on board run deep as the rescuers try to save the bird. Everybody was just stupefied and speechless and it, it just the reality of the impact on the animal community wasn't so real to me until I saw that oil bird and, and then it became like, oh my God, you know, it was so exhausted from trying to lift its wings, which weighed, weighed probably 20 times what they normally weigh because they were coated with oil. It had oil in its eyes and its mouth. It was everywhere. And two guys on the crew spent a couple of hours trying to clean it off as best they could and then BP sent over a boat to take this bird and to the, to the rescue center, to the rehab center on shore. It was terrifying. You know, his eyes had been completely like oiled over. He, he was completely drenched in oil. These researchers have a zeal for their work and seeing this bird only reinforces their desire to help the Gulf heal itself any way they can. The system is, is, is hard pressed to deal with that kind of an input and the response is, is going to be substantial, it's going to be prolonged in all likelihood and there's nothing we can do to undo this, it's done. The oxygen of the Gulf of Mexico is being depleted to dangerously low levels. Fish, dolphins, and whales are all in serious jeopardy. The problem is, is that it's happening in deep water and resetting the oxygen in that deep water is not something that's going to be happening over a time scale of months. It's going to take years to decades to do that. Unlike the surface ocean, which can be replenished in oxygen fairly easily, the oxygen in those waters came from, you know, was put there hundreds of years ago. Uh, it was put there when that water that's at the bottom of the Gulf now was actually in the polar regions. And, and so there's no real way to replenish this, this oxygen except for it to disperse the oxygen depletionary to disperse horizontally and eventually kind of dilute itself out if currents and, 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 and things like that let it disperse. That I think is the, is the biggest issue with the oil and gas that's in the water right now, you know, yes, there are going to be fisheries impacts, and yes, there are birds and sea turtles that are getting oiled up and, and harmed by this spill, but oxygen in the water is essential for everything and anything to live there, and I think we're approaching scary levels of oxygen in the, in the water column. And we went to a couple of stations late in the cruise where the upper water column had just over two milligrams per liter of oxygen and two milligrams per liter is where uh, things start to get sketchy for animals. Most animals are, in, are negatively impacted by oxygen lower than that. The surface and deep water oil and gas plumes from the deep water horizon wellhead cover thousands of square miles in the Gulf. An extraordinary amount of oil, 50,000 or more barrels per day has been literally injected into the Gulf of Mexico. Mankind has the technology to remove the oil from the surface of the Gulf waters and from the beaches. Ships like these two, towing boom, collect surface oil, which is later collected by a skimmer ship. But at depth, the problem gets more complicated. One of the significant problems for the recovery of the Gulf of Mexico is the deep water currents within this body of water, which will keep the deep oil circulating in the ecosystem for years. It's possible, if not likely, that the system's gonna be very different from what it used to be because it's a, in, in ecology, there's this concept of multiple stable states. And when you have a perturbation to a system, the system goes from here to here, and it may be chaotic in terms of how it's getting from one place to the next. Um, but at this point, I think it's impossible. We know the system used to be here, but where's it gonna go? We don't know. And, and what's the implication for the coastal fisheries? How much of this oil is gonna get incorporated into the food web of the Gulf of Mexico, and how long does it take to get that oil out of the food web? Those are questions that we just don't, we don't know the answer to because nothing like this has ever happened. After two exhausting weeks, the researchers finally pack up to return home. Their mission, a success, but their work is far from complete. 
Initial data was collected on board the Walton Smith, but much more work must be done in Dr. Joy's laboratory on the University of Georgia campus in Athens. We, we confirmed that the plumes exist. Uh, that, was the, that was the biggest thing. Uh, we learned a lot more about their chemistry and about what's going on in terms of the microbiology, what microbial activity is going on in, those, in the plume features and how it compares uh, with space and, and time over the study area. And we, we sort of confirmed that there's, there's oil in the water and that we found also that there's a lot of gas in the water. There's a lot of methane gas in the water. But the entire team know that in truth, this mission is just the beginning of the beginning. It's going to take years, decades, for the Gulf to start to return to what it was, and it most likely will never be the same again. Thanks to the work of Dr. Joy and her team, however, at least we can get an understanding of what happens in a catastrophe like this one. This should certainly help mitigate the effects of this crisis as far as is humanly possible, and it will of course help enormously if such an event ever happens elsewhere. But let's hope that if this disaster teaches us anything, it is that events like this must never be allowed to happen again.